Welcome, people. We're back with episode two. Uh, I appreciate a few people have reached out and said they liked the first episode and found it enjoyable. Uh, so I'm back with the next. This week's moment in popular culture was a scene from the 2017 film It. Let's take a look at the scene that made me stop and think, which is what this series is all about. Beverly! Why isn't she waking up? What is wrong with her? Beverly, please! Come on! Okay, let's talk about it. Well, before we can talk about the 2017 film, It, we gotta do some backtracking. Uh, now, the film is a remake of the 1990s TV miniseries, which is an adaptation of Stephen King's uh, more ginormous novel uh, by the same name. Right here, it is huge, right? To boot, the film has been made into two films, with the second film being released sometime in 2019. Um, by the way, naming your book after a common pronoun makes total sense for the story, uh, but it makes it horribly complicated to talk about. After all, each time I say it, you have to wonder if I'm talking about the lowercase it, the pronoun, which I'm likely to use to talk about the title, the capital I, it. The English language is ridiculous ridiculously complicated and anyone who gets mad uh, at people who are not native not not native speakers uh, can go take a long walk down the sewer with Pennywise but more on that later so we're dealing with a product of popular culture that is triply damned uh, in idle conversation I hear people lambast adaptations of books film remakes films that are extended beyond a single as signs of the apocalypse uh, somehow these things indicate that our culture has run empty but people I need to tell you cut that malarkey out Seriously, that argument is unoriginal because people have been doing this for hundreds of years. Yes, hundreds of years. Don't believe me? There's so many places to go with this. But let's go with some classic Greek. We have the Iliad and the Odyssey written by the, the most illustrious Homer. Uh, and I will save you the overused Simpson joke here, except that I kind of didn't. Oops. So Homer writes these two badass epic poems, and along come the playwrights after, who decide they like the story so much that they are going to rewrite it repeatedly, make sequels, and even create a sequel trilogy. It's called the Orsteia. Check it out. So a few hundred years later, and the Romans are so into the act, they're total fanboys and fangirls, if you would, um, that they decide to spin their own series off from Homer and call it the Aeneid. And just like The Force Awakens hits nearly every beat of A New Hope, so too does the Aeneid when compared to the Iliad and the Odyssey. And of course, we are retelling those tales still. Do you know how I first learned about the Odyssey? Swear to the powers that be. I became familiar with it and a fan of the Odyssey by watching DuckTales. I kid you not. Of course, I'm not talking about the remake of DuckTales, but the original series from the early 1990s. Woohoo! All right. Of course, I don't have to reach back hundreds of years. Uh, I can take a look at the 20th century and point out that, you know, uh, Frankenstein, the 1931 Boris Karloff, was a remake that Dracula with Bela Lugosi was a remake. The Wizard of Oz with Judy Garland was a remake. The Maltese Falcon with Humphrey Bogart was a remake. In fact, it was the third remake in a decade. Seriously, there are so many damn remakes out there that you don't even realize are out there. 
And many of them are fascinating and interesting and curious. Uh, remakes are not about uh, an absence of ideas, but rethinking old ideas in a new world. The Frankenstein that Thomas Edison told in, I think, 1915 is profoundly different than the one that was told in 1931. And that was deeply different from the few dozen that have been made, remade since. Then there's the issue of adaptations. We we, we also have to address, uh, and I mentioned Homer's epic poem uh, got turned into plays. Frankenstein, Dracula, Jekyll and Hyde all became plays in the, 19, in the 1800s and 1900s. Uh, adapting fiction into other forms has not only regularly happened, but again has been some of the most amazing and most popular films ever made. And that was the case well before the present. As I already mentioned, Dracula, Frankenstein, the Maltese Falcon, Wizard of Oz, they're all, they were all books first. So they were both second adaptation, uh, second remakes and adaptations. The James Bond, uh, James Bond is a book series. Uh, Psycho was a book first by Robert Block. Rosemary's Baby, also a book. I know I'm talking a lot about horror films, uh, but since I started with it, they're on my mind. Some other examples uh, to think of, The War of the Worlds, The Outsiders, The Color Purple, phenomenal book, phenomenal movie. The Perks of Being a Wallflower, also another phenomenal book, another phenomenal movie. Fight Club, need I say it again? In fact, Fight Club is interesting because the author has said that the movie is better than the book. So the author said the movie made about his book is better than his book. Think about that one. Um, we also have Let the Right One In. Right, So adapting fiction into film makes total sense because all film starts out as scripts, written works, and therefore making the transference is easy. And as history shows us, good books often make good films. I can't tell you whether it was, you know, whether the, and I can't tell you whether uh, the book or the Swedish film version of Let the Right One In is better. They're both amazing. Okay, so the final issue, uh, franchising a film. Yes, it's influenced by moneyed interest, but let's face it, we love our characters. We love our stories. Again, we saw this with the spinoffs from Homer's work, and that continues all the way to Dante, like two millennia later. Um, and he writes, you know, he writes in, in, in his Inferno, and it's a who's who, not only of Italy, but of biblic and epic characters. That again is part of our enjoyment is to see uh, what new stories can be spun about the, the worlds that we love. It's why despite my significant criticisms for Disney, I'm still impressed with how Disney has managed to capture, uh, th capture this idea for adults with both the Marvel and Star Wars universes. All of that is prefaced to say that in talking about it, I don't have issues with it being a remake, an adaptation, or a franchise. Uh, that's perfectly normal and intriguing for me. I think remakes and adaptations open up interesting reflections of culture and possible opportunities to compare and contrast which, what each time does with a given work. Uh, it's one of the coolest ways to have a point of comparison. Okay. Back to the film. I started all of this with a clip from It. Uh, the female among the group, Beverly Marsh, who within the film had really sex thrust upon her. Uh, her father sexually abuses her while her peers sexually harass her, implicating that she's a slut, uh, despite her claims of innocence. She's joined up with these group of boys and... Uh, it's emphasized that they are boys while she's stuck in this space of not a girl, but not quite a woman. Uh, so even among the losers, the, the, the group of protagonists, self-proclaimed name, she's an outsider. Uh, this becomes further evident within the film in a scene where the boys strip down to their underwear to jump into a rock quarry. And Beverly strips down to underwear in a bra. She's developing. She's in the state of becoming while they are still prepubescent. So we have a young woman who has been sexually assaulted, sexually harassed, and made outsider even among a group of outsiders. She's also the one that the villain, Pennywise, kidnaps 
to which the boys must rally and go and save. Thus, the scene you're watching is them coming upon Beverly, who is frozen and all dead-eyed. So they lower her down, and they're trying to figure out uh, how to wake her, how to save her. They yell. That doesn't work. They shake her. That doesn't work. So Ben, the blonde-haired boy in the scene, kisses her, and that somehow awakens her. With her awakened, the, key, the team can now defeat Pennywise, for now. The scene evokes memories of Sleeping Beauty, wherein the woman has been sent into an impenetrable, impenetrable if I could say the word, impenetrable, impenetrable sleep. Uh, in, the only, in only the kiss of a noble person, in this case Ben, will awaken her. Of course, this flies in the face of a very different scene from Stephen King's novel, It, uh, that neither... Uh, this film nor the 1990 film was ready to grapple with. Uh, but I'll leave you to Google that or read the original novel, uh, which is good. The novel, uh, the moment that I'm referring to, not so much. Okay, the scene as I watched it did not sit right with me. And it made me think about all the ways in which pop popular culture informs how we learn to interact with those we are sexually or romantically attracted to, how we court them, uh, and how we pursue long-term, serious, and casual relationships. It made me think of the Me Too movement and the discussion around it, where it has become clear how often and what direct, indirect, and microaggressive ways that women are sexually maligned, harassed, and assaulted. Uh, so how do we think about this scene in a world of Me Too? Pop culture, from novels to TV shows to music to, hell, even commercials, regularly present us with how attraction should and should not work. What it means to show interest, what it means to flirt, uh, what it means to try to court someone, what it means to date someone, what it means to make first sexual contact. Uh, we can all call upon a million examples that cover this. This is often where we take our cues uh, from or, or learn what it means to start some kind of a relationship with someone. And then we have this scene. Ben is romantically interested in Beverly, but her attention is, is largely more focused on Bill, the, the protagonist among them. Uh, he's also a heavyset kid, which sets him apart physically from the other kids who are all skinny by comparison. Uh, he's the token fat kid. Uh, films, don't, uh, films often do that with a cast of kids, uh, that one of them is on the heavier side, and so much of his, her, their identity is often defined with that. He, she, they uh, must be made fun of at some point. Their weight often serves as an obstacle, and he, she, they are usually... Uh, usually the one that's a little bit self-deprecating or the butt of, of jokes. Sometimes uh, they are presented as the funny one, uh, but they are rarely made you know, the center of attraction within, within many of these stories. And so as someone that grew up as that fat kid, uh, it's been something I've regularly seen and, and witnessed within, within storytelling. On a side note, uh, a good book and an okay movie to check out uh, is Fat Kid Rules the World by K.L. Going. Uh, I appreciated this book a lot, especially the opening scene, which has powerful, uh, which was powerful and just resonated with me a whole bunch. So hold on to these two things in uh, our head. We have pop culture tells us about relationships, and in it, we have a prepubescent boy romantically interested in a catatonic young woman. And in this scene, the only conceivable way for Ben to awaken that young catatonic woman, Beverly, besides shaking her and yelling her name, is to kiss her. That is, to sexually assault her. But it was just a kiss, I hear you saying. It was just a kiss by some chubby boy who never had a chance, as the film's conclusion shows us. Uh, and look, it worked. It was innocent. Uh, 
but I'm not sure that really matters. Or rather, it matters and it should concern us because the film is telling us that this is okay. The film is telling young men and young boys, and yes, they will see this movie, even if it is R-rated, right? If I was watching Psycho, Nightmare on Elm Street, and Friday the 13th by the time I was nine, uh, in the age of videotape, you can be damn sure kids and teens are watching R-rated. Hell, they're watching X-rated materials uh, by the same age in the world of the internet. But the film is telling young, bo young men and boys uh, that when a woman is catatonic, when a young woman has no control over her body, they can or should take advantage of the situation to awaken her or even save her. Now, I'm not saying this and thinking this was the intention of the creators, be it the filmmakers or Stephen King. King is often a progressive voice who advocates feminist ideas, sometimes to varying or problematic effects in his work, but certainly as a public figure. Check him out on Twitter. Uh, they are not necessarily thinking about or always fully aware of the connotations of their work because they are often so deeply entrenched in the culture as the rest of us are, and therefore it can be hard for them to see what they might be suggesting. But what I am saying is that just like so many other scenes within popular culture influence our sense of what romantic and sexual relations look like, this one will also influence us. Especially in the age of the Me Too movement, I can't help but look at this scene and think about what it communicates uh, about a complicitness of such things. Five boys standing around a young catatonic woman and the most logical action to take is to kiss her. What happens in eight years when there are five young men at a party? The moment evokes the concept of rape culture. Now, for those of you not familiar with the term rape culture, I've got another recommendation for you. Asking for it, the alarming rise of rape culture and what we can do about it by Kate Harding. Check it out. It's an eye-opener for many people and an affirmation uh, to experiences by way too many people in our society. The premise of rape culture is that we live in a society whose structure accepts, if not promotes, rape as a feature of it. This happens in large part because despite what we may be told about previous ways of gender-based equality, social structures still often encourage a discourse where men are the aggressor to the point that their actions are not even seen as aggressive, but perfectly natural, in that girls, women, and trans folk need to adhere and or protect themselves from this acceptance. So, Rape culture is disbelieving women who say they've been sexually harassed or assaulted. It's also when we ask, what was she wearing? Rape culture is when we tell females how not to get raped constantly, but rarely tell males, don't rape or don't allow others to rape, with the same vigilance. Rape culture is when we tell girls that the boy who is picking on her is doing it because he likes her thus connecting harassment with affection. And yes, rape culture is also portraying a young boy kissing a catatonic girl, young woman as an appropriate means of saving her. Whew, that's a lot to think about. So I'm going to end it there and give you some time to process. Right? We've covered a lot today. Uh, we talked about adaptations and remakes and franchises uh, in it as an example of all three. We've had a brief dis discussion of the fat kid trope. Uh, we've also delved into thinking about how gender and relationships uh, are depicted in popular culture and how it contributes to our understanding of, uh, of Me Too and sexual harassment and assault, uh, as well as starting to understand or unpack what we mean by rape culture. So I'll leave you with just this thought, or question rather. Where else have you seen scenes like this. I know I can think of many over the decades, but what about you? 
start keeping an eye out and try to sit with such scenes and see what the connotation is and how we should make sense of it in our present world. All right. Thank you, everyone. I will see you next week. Take care.